Tim, thank you so much for leading us. And it's particularly pertinent as well that you talk about kingship because we're going to look at that again in Hosea in a moment. And you didn't know that, did you? You didn't know that, no. And it's particularly great to see the Tower of London up there because Rachel and I and Laura went there just last week uh, when I was off and spent a day um, at the Tower of London, a day at the Natural History Museum. Have I gone off? Okay. A, d a day at the Natural History Museum, and my favourite was to see some of the kings that are named in the Bible at the British Museum. And we're going to come across some of those shady characters later. So uh, we also had some friends visiting us. And before you recoil in shock that we have friends, I mentioned to somebody, uh, to, to, to my friend Giles, and said, uh, there's, a, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about breaking up the fallow ground, and it's always resonated with me. Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. And, and he went straight away, yeah, that's Hosea 10, 14. I was like, wow, that's amazing how you knew that. I said, I knew that, of course. I was just testing you. And the verse that we're going to read that I wanted to bring for us today to, to bless us, to encourage us, to challenge us, for us to hear God speak comes straight out of the heart of God, out of the heart of the 8th century BC, out of the heart of Hosea himself, out of the heart of Scripture. Um, it's a wonderful verse, and many of you will have come across it. And it goes something like this. Sow for yourselves righteousness... Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. It is time. Oh, which reminds me that we also have prayer, church prayer, this Tuesday evening. You don't want to miss it. Hmm? Do I get an amen to that? <laughs> it is time to seek the Lord. There's something for all of us in this verse. And before we crack on, and we'll let, <laughs> we'll let you settle, I'm going to pray for us. Our Father, you are so good. Lord, you've reminded us this morning of your sovereign kingship over us, your heart for us. And yet here we are, Lord, again, here before you, before each other, saying yes to the sovereign king of the universe, despite all of the confusions and pains that we carry, that we have, maybe even, Lord, some doubts around our relationship with you, and yet here we are. So, Father, may we hear your word to us this morning. May it be living and active. May it carry us, Lord, uh, closer to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've remembered, but if I may remind you, you have remembered, I'm sure, God is still alive. Amen. God is active. God is on the move. God is speaking. Still. We're, what are we, just two Sundays after Easter Sunday? It's amazing how the resurrection language drops from our Sunday services, isn't it? Including me and anyone who leads as well. But we, we have a resurrected Christ. And the power that was in him, that raised him from the dead, look around, look around at each other now. That power is in you. And you're thinking, well, it doesn't really feel like it to, but it is. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's the promise of Scripture. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you, is in me. Is in me. That's how ridiculous the gospel is. It's in me. God is on the move. He's active and he's speaking. And so this verse from Hosea chapter 10 comes straight out of the Old Testament story. And the biblical kings of Israel in the north and the ten tribes and Judah in the south, as, the, as you go through the Old Testament storyline, were mostly wicked kings, idolatrous, offering child sacrifice, just wanting to be like the surrounding nations, adulterous, disloyal, covenantally unfaithful. They just couldn't have cared less. They were awful men and women. 
and they were God's covenant people. There were one or two exceptions, and we can come to those on another day. The surrounding nations at the time of Hosea were in turmoil. Ring any bells? Nothing new under the sun, is there? The surrounding nations are still in turmoil. The people are lost in sin, blind to truth, deaf to righteousness. They are numb towards God. Maybe some of us feel lost and blind and deaf and numb even in our faith. But God is alive. And the power that, is, that raised Christ from the dead it is in you if you believe. That's the promise. It's possibly the only thing that we should believe. The power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. So, if the surrounding nations of Hosea's day are like that then, and the surrounding nations are like this today, that the world hasn't changed, and we are just like them. We are just like them. This is why the gospel must be proclaimed in the world today. We are just like them. But, glory, hallelujah, God is not a squeamish God. If I showed Laura an actual or a picture of a crushed worm, she would, she would run away because she's squeamish. But God is not a squeamish God. He's not afraid of our strangeness, our sin, our disloyalty, our blindness, our um, numbness to him. He still calls us, doesn't he? Can you hear him calling you? Have you ever heard the God of history and of the scriptures and of Jesus Christ calling you? It changes everything. Because he's doing it. And if we can't hear or won't hear or don't hear, then that's on us because God is a speaking God. And we need him to break through, which is precisely what this verse is about. He is active, he's on the move, and he's speaking so that he can save, heal, redeem, and restore us. Now, Hosea, has anybody read Hosea recently? It's an astonishing love story. It's like Ruth, but the perverse version of Ruth in the Bible. Poor Hosea. He was uh, ministering around 2,750 years ago. 2,750 years ago, give or take a week or two, maybe. Right in the tumultuous 8th century BC, and it was tumultuous on the global stage of world history. Israel's kings were wicked and idolatrous, as I've said, and Hosea was called by God to literally live a life that mirrored their wickedness, their betrayal, their idolatry, their disloyalty. God called this righteous man, Hosea, as a prophet and said, your life is going to feel the pain that I feel to my people. It was heartbreaking. What did he do? He was called to marry a prostitute and have children with her. And this prostitute, this poor woman, she would go off with many lovers, just like God's people go off with many lovers, just like they ignore the covenant, just like they build shrines to Molech and Baal and sacrifice their children to it and to them. And Hosea had to live this out whilst remaining in relationship with the God who called him and preaching the message to God's people. Did they hear? Century after century after century, no. But God never stops speaking. God is a speaking God. He is on the move and he's active. So Hosea's wife would keep running after other lovers and Hosea would keep receiving her back and 
it was, it's utterly heartbreaking when you read the story. But Hosea's name is the clue to, to who God is, to what the message is about. Hosea is a derivative of Hoshea, and Hoshea is a derivative of Joshua, and Joshua is a derivative of Yeshua, and Yeshua is God is salvation, is what the names mean. Hoshea and his message are reflected in his name. You look at, do this as a little sort of side search, maybe do it in Bible study groups or something. Check out the meaning of every prophet's name, and it bears a resemblance to the message they were called to bring. It's amazing. It's amazing. Let's take an example. A contemporary of Hosea, who you might have heard of, Jonah. His name means dove. Didn't he fly away, little birdie? What happened to him? That's another story. But the message is sometimes contained as a secret and a clue to the names that they have. And as an extra point of historical interest, before I finish, Hosea ministered, reigned, prophesied, spoke, enacted his ministry that God had given him during the reign of certain kings of Judah. We will have heard of some of them. Uzziah. So he's a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah too, but Uzziah the king. Where do we most famously hear his name? Chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord lifted up. And the angels went forth, holy, holy, holy. And he recognized his own sin and so on. So we've heard of Uzziah, we've heard of Jotham, we've heard of King Ahaz, we've heard of King Hezekiah. Famously, King Hezekiah was one of the good ones. Ahaz was one of the wicked ones. They were all of the line of David. And in the northern kingdom, which is only 25 minutes, uh, 25 minutes, 25 years from being obliterated, taken out, exiled, wiped off the map, punished by God, because they didn't listen to the messages of the prophets. And God's patience finally snapped 25 years after Hosea delivered his message. So in the north is the famous Jeroboam II of Israel. And the mighty empire threatening the nations was the empire of Assyria. Now, I'm going to tell you the names of the kings of Assyria that ministered during the time of Hosea. And I'm going to tell you these for a reason, so stay alert. I'm going to show them in a moment. The first one is one of my favorites. What a name this is, huh? Tiglath Pileser III. 745 to 727. A powerful king of Assyria. The next one, Shalmaneser. 727 to 722. He's named in chapter 10 of Hosea. Look at verse 14. Therefore, the tumult of war, God says, shall arise among the people, and all you, all, all I can't see because my eyes are blurred, and all your fortresses shall be destroyed, and Shalman, as Shalman destroyed Beth Abel on the day of battle. Shalman, it's the same king here named. Hosea is right in the thick of it. Then there's King Sargon of Assyria, 722 to 705. He was responsible for taking away God's covenant people. Ten tribes, gone. Never existed again as an entity. The sword of judgment came down. Enough, God had said. And Hosea's ministering, and Isaiah's ministering, and Jonah's ministering, and on and on. The speaking God speaks. And then finally, we've heard of Sennacherib out of the book of Isaiah. He's particularly named there, 705 to 681. So we know what sort of era we're dealing with. Now, if that didn't make your feet tingle with excitement, it did, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Then this will. I don't have actual photos of the kings of Israel and Judah. But did you know, well I do, but I'm not showing it today because I want your ears to tingle as well. Did you know that there is only one physical representation of a biblical king in existence and I saw it last week at the British Museum. 
So maybe we should arrange a trip to the British Museum. Is there anybody here that owns a coach? Maybe we could be in discussion about something like this to see the only physical depiction of a biblical king bowing down, paying tribute to one of the kings of Assyria. So, I don't have that photo. I deliberately don't want to show that because I want that to be the chatter as you eat your chicken at dinner time. But I do have a photo of the bad boys of the kings of Assyria. Let's see what this one is. Yes. Okay, so that's the nearest artist sketch I could get to what Hosea looks like. That's just to remind us that he lived a while ago, and I've forgotten to do my slides here. We have Israel in the north and Judah in the south, as you can see. It's coming through, isn't it? Loud and clear. That's good. But I do have photos of the Assyrian kings that I've just named. Look at this. This is so exciting. Top left, Tiglath-Pileser III. Brutal. Then we have Shalmaneser, top right, and Sargon, bottom left, and Sennacherib. These are all in the British Museum. These are all uh, parts of the Assyrian kings and palaces and empire that was discovered um, less than 200 years ago. And for so many centuries, they said, the Bible's not true. There's no evidence for the Assyrians. Hello. It's still there. And they're still saying God doesn't exist. They're still saying the Bible's not true. Cobblers. So I saw these guys just last week. These guys were fierce. They were warriors. They ruled a brutal empire. And these were the guys used by God to judge his people. This is what God did. He used this evil, pagan, wicked empire ruled by these guys to bring judgment on his people who simply refused his message of love. To be faithful. <laughs> to be faithful. To not sacrifice your children. To not give over your futures. To live in the land well. But all the while, God's people are forgetful, they're lost, they're wayward, they're wicked, they are idolatrous. They just want to fit in and be like the other nations. None of us are teenagers. Is there any teenagers here? I better make, make, make not, no assumptions here on this point, but when you're a teenager especially, you just want to fit in, right? When did you grow out of that? We just want to fit in, we just want to be liked. We want people to like us. We want others to, 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 we want to like others. Israel's no different. There's nothing new under the sun. They just wanted to be like all of the other nations. They certainly don't want to upset these guys. No, because it turns out that dancing with the devil doesn't have any health benefits whatsoever. They will get you in the end. So everything is bad and God is good. The world is going to hell in a handcart, but God is continually, through his word, through the prophets and their, their, their actions and their speech, calling God's people back. The world is going to hell in a handcart, but God is still paving his highway to heaven. There is no doubt about that. And Hosea may not have a trophy wife, but he has a catastrophe wife. I'm sorry, that's the best I can do. Trophy, catastrophe. There's definitely something there, isn't there? There's a joke there, Mike, right? Catastrophe, trophy. He's working it out. God is working out his salvation, his wonders to perform. God is salvation. And so any catastrophe can be turned into a trophy in Jesus' name. That's why the Bible says no sin is too great. No sinner is too lost. Any catastrophe can be turned into a trophy in Jesus' name. Any catastrophe. So, 10 verse 6, chapter 10 verse 6 says, talking of this king here, he's mentioned, 
tribute will be carried to Assyria for the great king, Tiglath-Pileser III, this guy, top left. The next verse, Samaria and its king will float away like a twig on the surfaces of the waters. They're going to be taken into exile and never heard of again. Floating away like a twig is how scripture puts it. So powerfully poetic. And that's exactly what happens. You can read all about it in 2 Kings 17 that charts the exile of God's people to these guys. To these guys. It was the worst of times and it was the worser of times. There was no goodness there. So in this context, God is active, he's on the move, and he's speaking so that he may save. And so the message goes out. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap the fruit of unfailing love. And break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. Until he showers righteousness on you. Try showering righteousness on yourself. <laughs> See what a pickle you get into. Seek the Lord until he comes, until he comes, until he comes, in his time, when he's ready, at the right time, when he says he will do it, but wait, but wait, but wait with oil in your lamps. Be faithful, be patient, but wait until he comes. Glory to Jesus Christ. Which reminds me, we have a church prayer meeting on Tuesday night. You don't want to miss it. So this is a tough message of love from the heart of God to God's people, and it's for us today. The people were sowing unrighteousness, and so were reaping idolatrous judgment. The ground was unplowed. The ground of their heart, the soil of their lives was unplowed. It was fallow, as some translations put it, fallow. Now, we're in Somerset. We don't have many farms in Somerset, but I was wondering if there was a farmer amongst us. Arthur, what does fallow mean in the farming world? Do you know? Off the top of your head. I'm sorry, this is a cold call. <laughs> Just sort of le left. Huh? Resting. Resting, Okay. That'll, that'll do. I've got the dictionary definition, so whatever. Um, you, you might learn something from me now. <laughs> Fallow means cultivated land that is allowed to lie idle during the growing season. What does this mean? Chapter 10, verse 1 of Hosea says, Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. <gasps> And the more, fruit, the more his fruit increased, the more altars he built to foreign gods. Israel is supposed to be a luxuriant vine, but the land is fallow and she is idle when she is meant to be producing fruit. Fruit that the nations are supposed to eat. And it's exactly the, exactly the same for us that the fruits of the Spirit in our lives are meant not just for our own edification, they are that too, but for others to enjoy. Others to enjoy the fruits of what God has given us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Have I missed any out? You know. In other words, the ground of Israel, of God's covenant people, were not doing what they should be doing. They were only called to one thing, to love God. And God will do everything else. He'll do everything else. They were only called to that one thing. So how's the ground of your life doing, church? How's the ground of your heart? Is it fallow? when it should be producing fruit? Is it idle when it should be producing? Because there's a time for rest and there's a time for work. Maybe some of us have lost a lively 
faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe our, our lively faith has been allowed to die and we just need God. Well, this message is for you as much as it is for me today. And in the midst of tumultuous and heartbreaking world events as we face, as Tim led us in prayer and our service, thank you, Tim, for that, by the way. It's never-ending, isn't it? Makes you ask the question, doesn't it? Maybe the principalities and powers at large in the world are real after all. And all of our control freakery at trying to manage our lives isn't quite enough. Maybe God is working something else on a much bigger stage than we had possibly imagined. Maybe the relentless cor of corruption in Hosea's day mirrors our own day. There's nothing new under the sun. It just looks different. It's packaged different. It's a lot shinier in our day, but it's just as wicked. It's just as corrupt. It's just as sleazy. War in Europe, war around the world, sleaze in Parliament, the MP on Honiton or whatever, watching pornography on the benches of Parliament, representing his constituency. Are you kidding me? But he's not the problem. He is symptomatic of the problem. And the problem is human sin and saying no to God. And we walk our own way. Pray for that man. He's resigned now, as he jolly well should. But what level do you have to stoop to think that that on any page is a good thing to do. Lord, have mercy. Many will snigger about that story as though it's a, a schoolboy error, but it's just the evidence of a fallow life that reflects what is fallow in our life too. And so we project out, we look at him, we look at them. If I want to make myself feel better, I'll look at some of your sins. And as a pastor, we get to talk about some of those serious things occasionally. That's exactly why I'm here. It's exactly why you're here. To do the work of ministry. And every Christian has their battles. There's a wonderful book by Vaughan Roberts called The Battles, Battles Christians Face. Many of you would have heard of Vaughan Roberts. Should, this should be given to every young Christian. Every young Christian. Look at the titles on some of uh, the chapter headings of, 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 of the book. Image. You struggled with image? Anybody? You struggled with lust? Anybody? How about guilt? How about doubt? How about depression? How about pride? How about homosexuality? How about keeping spiritually fresh? Why should we keep fresh? Because the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour. Sometimes we choose these battles. We fall into sin. We make choices and we convince ourselves. We, we might blame our childhood or we might blame our psychological weakness or something. But really it's us covering our tracks. But sometimes our battles choose us. You know when you feel like you've been hit by a steam train? Where did that come from? And so we offer it all to God. But whatever we do, we must fight. We need the God who is salvation. And the word of God is simple and direct to us at this point, church. Break up what is fallow and idle in your life. It is time to seek the Lord. Which reminds me, on Tuesday night, we have a prayer meeting at the church. It is time to seek the Lord, and we need to do this together. We need to do this. This is not me guilt-tripping, by the way. I'm trying to, trying to do it slightly humorously, but this is serious business. We need to seek the Lord. We need to pray for Lauren, who's leaving. We need to pray for Janusz, who's sick. We need to pray whatever is driving your anxieties right now. I need to pray for you, and you need to pray for me. It is time to seek the Lord. Amen? Because it is always time to seek the Lord, that he may come and shower righteousness on you. Shower. I'm going to finish with this bit now. 
until God showers righteousness on you. How many of you had a bath this morning? A bath? Eric, get out. <laughs> now, now this, this next question might be tricky. If you didn't, for a number of reasons, put your hand up anyway, just, you know, but how many of you showered this morning? That's, that's most of Eric! This passage in Hosea, until the Lord showers righteous, so there's a timing element, until God chooses. We don't know when that is. We can't control, manipulate, or predict. It's when God says, until the Lord comes and showers righteousness on you. That word for showers or rain comes straight out of the world of archery. Archery. You know, uh, the, you've seen some film. Anyone here seen the film 300? about the heroic, thank you Jonathan, I have two, it's a marvellous film, a bit violent, but it's the heroic stand of the 300 Spartan warriors against the Persians, the guys that came after the guys that we've just talked about, after the ones that came after them. Brutal. And what happens in ancient warfare with the archers, and you see this in the medieval period too, the archers would be commanded to loose the arrows and they would fly through the air towards the enemy, obviously. But when you had a massive army, the sky, the, the, the sky would turn black with the arrows as though, night, as though day becomes night. Such was the ferocity of the arrows. This is the image of showering righteousness on us that God wants. And these arrows of God will not kill, hurt, or maim us. They will heal us. They will break through our defenses. They will break us. They will shatter whatever illusions we have about ourselves and about the world so that we are set free because it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. He alone can pierce whatever we have allowed to harden just as much as he can raise whatever is dead in us. So yes, it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. And yes, if you believe in Christ, and I think one or two of you might just say yes to that, you do believe in Christ. You are clothed with Christ right now. You're clothed with him. There's nothing you can do about that. He lives in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's done it all. So we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ once God's arrows have hit the mark. And we simply say, yes, you are the Lord, and I surrender. And Jesus will forgive all your sins if you come to him and say again, you're the Lord. You are the Lord. You are king, as we remembered earlier. And this is the truth of the promise that comes out of Holy Scripture. Oh, here's a picture of the arrows, by the way. Nope, it's not working. Yeah, it's not very clear in this light, but you can just about make out the arrows. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 then says that the gospel comes to us not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and full of conviction. It's not lily-livered. It's full of conviction and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Gospel, word, power, spirit, conviction. And it is still the gospel that breaks what is fallow and idle in our relationship with God. It is still the gospel that is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is still the gospel that shows forth the righteousness of Christ and his unfailing, relentless, unstoppable love. And it is still the gospel of Jesus Christ alone that promises the arrows of God's righteousness. The arrows of God's righteousness. Gospel, word, power, spirit, conviction. All glory to Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. I want to, before Tim comes up, I'd like to just invite us to respond to that. Some of us need to 
to do some real serious business with, with God's word now with us. But we're going to respond together, but for some of you it will be more pertinent than others. But we'll do this as an act of support and solidarity with each other because we all need God's arrows to rain down on us. We all need God's arrows to rain down on us. So can I invite you to stand? There are some here who need these arrows of God to strike home. So if this is you, I, I would invite you to pray with me. So let us pray, church. God of all comfort and mercy. God of unfailing love and righteousness. We need you to pierce the armor that we wear. The layers that we create and the barriers that we construct. We need both the gentle dew that soaks us in the Holy Spirit and we need the armor-piercing arrows, arrows of our warrior God. That in our desperate need, we would indeed be livened and raised again to new life in Christ. That our only hope in this life and the next is Jesus Christ. That in a book such as Hosea, where wickedness abounds, we remember grace abounds all the more, Lord. Where death and destruction crouch at the door, it is that door that Jesus is knocking to come in for fellowship. Where our life sucks out the true life of God, we pray for Holy Spirit resurrection power to raise us with Christ. When Satan has asked to sift us like wheat, we remember that we are nourished by the bread of life. In a world that has fallen, we trust in the one who was risen. When our faith is domesticated, when our talk is cheap and our walk is lame, when even going through the motions of uh, of life bores us to tears when our wounds are raw help us to reach out and touch the hem of your garment lord jesus we pray break us with your arrows of righteousness that we might might see your face we do repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand lord jesus you have not left us alone and so we ask once again for the promise of the paraclete, the helper, the sustainer, the empowerer, and our healer, that we may live in the truth of your unfailing love as your redeemed, happy, and trusting people, bearing the fruit of the kingdom. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Gospel, word power, spirit, conviction. So, Father, hear our prayer. We offer it in the glorious name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Bless you, church.